The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in all of history. Jesus did rise from the dead, and it does not take blind faith to believe it. All credible historians, whether Christian, atheist, or agnostic, acknowledge the life and death of Jesus Christ. Even skeptics acknowledge his crucifixion. Though skeptics do not believe in his resurrection, all of the evidence points to the truth that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, his crucifixion was just the death of a good teacher. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, his crucifixion was just the death of a prophet. But because Jesus did bodily rise from the dead three days after his death, we can have full confidence that he is in fact the only true Lord and only true Savior. He really is who he claimed to be. The evidence is so compelling that skeptics will generally attack the validity of the resurrection using one of three arguments. The first is called the conspiracy argument. The second, the myth argument. The third is the hallucination argument. However, none of these arguments against the resurrection hold up when compared to the historical facts. They are all grasping at straws. All four of the Gospels record women as the first witnesses of the empty tomb. To us today, this seems like no big deal. But 2,000 years ago, just about every ancient culture discounted the testimony of women, especially Roman, Greek, and Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, women were not considered to be worthy to handle the scripture. In many Roman and Greek writings, there is clear evidence that a woman's testimony would not even be considered in court. Women were viewed as less than men in the ancient world. Because of this, no ancient writer would ever create a fabricated story that had women as the central and first eyewitnesses, especially to something as large as the resurrection of a promised messiah. Recording that fact actually hurts the validity of the story in the ears of ancient hearers. Yet, in each of the four Gospels, it records women as being the first people to see Jesus Christ after he had risen from the dead. The Gospels even humiliatingly show that Jesus' closest disciples were in fear, hiding away. Then, when the woman reported to them that Jesus had risen from the dead, the Gospels record that they did not believe the women. We can say with confidence that the Gospels were recorded accounts and not fabricated stories. After 2,000 years of history, we have all been saturated with the story of Christ's death and resurrection. However, in the ancient world, this story would have appeared to be total foolishness. In a culture and civilization that honored status and power, the message of a savior that tasted death would have been a total embarrassment to those promoting the message that Jesus was both Lord and Savior. Crucifixion was a vile and disgusting death. It was a death reserved for the worst of criminals and the lowest of slaves that rebelled against their masters. If the disciples wanted to fabricate a story that would have won over the masses, they would never have promoted the idea of a Savior dying for the sins of the world as he suffered helpless on a cross, forgiving his enemies who crucified him. To an ancient audience, this looked like incredible weakness and humiliation. In each Gospel account, we also see that Jesus' disciples abandoned him. Only John was present at the cross with several of the women who had followed Jesus. The rest of Jesus' followers and disciples were fearfully hiding away from the authorities. They had no expectation of a resurrection. Some skeptics try to say that the body was stolen from the tomb. There is no way that the disciples would have stolen his body from the tomb. The Romans wouldn't have taken the body and neither would the Jewish leaders. Theft of the body is a total impossibility. After his death, Jesus was buried in the tomb of a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. This means that he would have been buried in an area very close to the oversight of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jerusalem is a relatively small city and at the time of Jesus' death, it was the Passover, which meant people were everywhere. Some historians estimate there could have been one million people there. But even if there were only 500,000, the city would have been packed and eyes would have been everywhere. Pilate assigned a group of soldiers, numbering likely around 16, to guard the tomb, and they placed an imperial seal on the tomb. These soldiers would have been battle-hardened warriors that understood that if they failed their mission to protect the body, they would all be put to death. 
There is no way a band of 11 Jews composed of fishermen, a tax collector, and some other trades would have been able to steal a body from under these soldiers, even if they tried. The Gospel accounts show all of the disciples hiding and afraid after the death of Jesus. Along with this, Jesus always preached nonviolence to his followers in response to persecution and Roman oppression. To rebel against this would have been a great dishonor to their teacher. We see that when Judas came with the temple guard to arrest Jesus, Peter struck the servant to the high priest and Jesus immediately rebuked Peter and even healed the servant's ear. Therefore, it is an impossibility that the body was stolen. In order for you to see how reliable the Gospel accounts are, I want to point out to you that they actually record the Sanhedrin promoting the theory that the followers of Jesus stole his body. No myth or fabricated story would ever include information in it to discredit itself. The recording of these facts literally creates opportunity for doubt in the hearer and the reader. But the writers of the Gospels had one goal, accurate relaying of the information. They included the facts of the entire story. The truth is that the authors of the Gospel are relating factual accounts of what actually happened. Some try to say that the story of the resurrection is a myth that came about centuries later. The problem with this is that we have historical evidence from non-Christian writers claiming that the early Christians, after the death of Christ, did in fact believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Several of the epistles of Paul are the earliest Christian documents that have been discovered to date, and he references in 1 Corinthians 15, 4-7, a creed that was common amongst the Christians within three years of Jesus' resurrection. Paul states in the creed that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. Even skeptics acknowledge the accuracy and historical dating of Corinthians, as well as the earliest Christian creeds. This means that it is impossible that the resurrection was fabricated at a much later date. Jesus' earliest followers believed that he did, in fact, rise from the dead. We also have historical evidence of contemporary skeptics at that time being converted to Christianity, the first being Paul the Apostle. Paul had been a Pharisee and one of the most ardent and firm persecutors of the early church. He was likely responsible for the death of some of the earliest Christians. He encountered the risen Jesus Christ and switched from being the biggest enemy of Christianity to its biggest supporter and proponent. He gave up status, power, and wealth to become a follower of Jesus Christ. He traded prestige and power for lowliness and persecutions. If the body of Jesus Christ had been in the tomb where he was buried, there is no way Paul would have just believed the message of the Christians. There are also several references throughout the New Testament where it is clear that he was once an enemy of Christ before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. He mentions this himself. We also see that James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic until after Jesus' resurrection. James did not initially believe that his brother was the Messiah. This is seen in the Gospel where Jesus' family mocks him. This change in James only came about after the resurrection. The change was so great that James eventually became the leader of the Jerusalem church. He went from total skeptic to one of the most prominent followers of Jesus. Jerusalem is where Christianity began. When the disciples were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the authorities could have easily provided the body of Jesus and quelled all mention of Jesus rising from the dead. Christianity could have been stopped dead in its tracks if it was just a made-up story. The disciples did not run away from the place of Jesus' death and go to some distant land to spread the gospel. In fact, Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, commanded them to stay in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit and to preach first in Jerusalem, then Judea, and then Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. Cults always want to protect their new converts from information that conflicts with the message of the cult. That means that they initially move them away from anybody or anything that would contradict 
the belief, or the promotion of the cult. Instead, in the early church, we see the disciples living lives right in the center of the culture around them and preaching the gospel. It was not a separatist movement at all. It's why persecutions came so quickly. As the apostles eventually began to spread the gospel in other places, they would establish new churches. When these new churches would form, the apostles would move on to continue the mission of spreading the gospel, leaving the new churches vulnerable to corruption. New Testament history definitely shows no overlording or controlling by the apostles with new converts or new churches, which is totally contradictory to the way that all cults operate. All of the apostles and early Christians were heavily persecuted. All of the apostles except John were killed in torturous and tormentous ways because they would not deny that Jesus was the Christ and had risen from the dead. People can die for a lie that they believe to be true, but no one dies a torturous death for what they know to be a lie. Think about it. We're not just talking about one man. We're talking about the 12 apostles, Paul, Stephen, and many others that claim to witness the resurrection. Not one of them ever denied that they had in fact seen Jesus rise from the dead. Some skeptics will try to say that all the disciples hallucinated Jesus' resurrection. There is no evidence in history of a mass hallucination that would enable a resurrection story like we see in the Gospels. Hallucinations are generally limited to one or two people. In actual modern scientific research, it's shown that hallucinations are very often transitory and short. Comparing instances of people stuck at sea, thinking that they're seeing a ship in the distance, to the resurrection accounts in the Gospels, makes a hallucination totally implausible. The Gospels record Jesus showing up on multiple occasions to multiple groups of people, speaking to them, eating with them, and allowing them to touch him. The resurrection account isn't a claim of Jesus showing up to just one person. The resurrection account shows Jesus as having a physical body, one that can be touched and one that can even eat. A multi-event hallucination among several groups of people at different times with full sensory experiences of touching the person and seeing them eat food would literally be a supernatural miracle unto itself. In the Gospel accounts, the disciples constantly chastise themselves for their own unbelief, which adds even greater credibility to the accounts. We don't read that they knew Jesus was going to rise from the dead. We see accounts of them being totally shocked and dumbfounded. Not to mention that, but also contemporary skeptics of that time came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This means that there is no way that the resurrection of Jesus Christ could have been a hallucination. The message of the gospel was one that flew in the face of everything that was elevated in Roman and Greek culture. It was a message of turning from sin and turning to a crucified Savior that rose from the dead so that an individual might be right with God through the death of someone else, namely Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God the Son. This is why Paul calls the message foolishness in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The message of the cross looks like total foolishness to the world today, but it would even more so back then in ancient times. It would have been a message that challenged the culture and everything it valued. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 1.19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greek foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The real reason it is so hard for people to believe the gospel is because the gospel has ramifications. Jesus rising from the dead has consequences for both you and me. 
It means that he truly is the savior of the world. It means that there will be a day where God judges both the living and the dead to either eternal life or eternal damnation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that we cannot save ourselves through our own good works or religion. It means that we are entirely dependent upon someone else for the removal of our sins and the receiving of our salvation. And this person we are dependent upon is the person that we have all sinned against, God himself. It is much easier to deny the resurrection than to have to deal with the consequences of it. It is why so many people blindly believe the theories against the resurrection without seeing all of the historical evidence. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is clear. It takes more faith to believe the resurrection didn't happen than to believe that it did happen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ happened 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross paying the full penalty for your sin. On the cross, the wrath of God for your sins was poured out onto Jesus Christ. However, He overcame sin, He overcame death, He overcame the grave, and the resurrection is a promise that if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus and His work on the cross, you will receive eternal life. The resurrection shows us that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that He is the only way for our sins against God to be forgiven, that God will in fact judge every soul according to the deeds done in the body, that Jesus is the only one qualified to pay for our debt of sin, that He is the only road that leads to true life, that apart from Him there is no eternal life, that His words are trustworthy, that the Bible is in fact the Word of God, that God is able to overcome all of the work of sin and Satan in our lives if we believe in Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus shows that he was more than a man, more than a good person, more than a moralist. He was more than a good teacher. He was more than a religious leader. He was more than a prophet. He was in fact God in the flesh. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What are you gonna do about it? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.